Welcome to the Sailing Into Oblivion podcast, where we hear stories from everyday people who do extraordinary things. I'm your host, Jerome Rand. All right, welcome. We are live. You're aboard Mighty Sparrow, or at least I am right now, cruising on night number two out on the ocean, left Buford against all better judgment on a Friday, uh, about 8.30 in the morning. And went on the intercoastal, proper intercoastal, first time for me. <laughs> and uh, that took about five hours or so. But I played it just right. The tide was coming in, rode that to one part of it, and then rode the tide right out into the ocean. And then got to watch the sea change from brown to sort of greenish, grayish, to blue, and then the next day woke up and it was absolutely stunning. So, yeah, I'm out in the ocean now and um, got out and it was blowing. Uh, This wind window that I have found so far has been perfect. Probably just jinked myself. I know that I do have a little bit of a, a northerly coming in just for about a day or so. But um, winds out of the south, southwest, perfect for heading out towards the Gulf Stream. And yeah, basically just was headed almost due east, straight out of Buford. Um, and as I got a little closer to Charleston, you know, I, I don't know. I could not count how many ships were out there. I couldn't see them all because it was nighttime, but I could uh, see them on the AIS, and it was just literally just a blob <laughs> of ships anchored out there. So obviously the maritime industry is still dealing with a lot of uh, backup and, and all sorts of stuff. But in any event, I was able to sort of skirt by all that without too much problem, and then... Uh, finally get some sleep it took a while and it always does my the first night anytime i i take off no matter what the trip is the first night i i rarely ever get more than just a couple hours and uh you know i don't know if it's just me listening to the boat or just not being used to the motion or what but um eventually i was able to uh fall asleep and i remember waking up <laughs> I'm just thinking I had I hadn't even slept a minute, but then went on deck and there was already sort of that morning half light. So it was a nice little surprise, actually. Got to uh, know that I actually got it. Now, oh man, we are doing like ten knots right now. I may have to cut this one short. I'm just going to do a bunch of segments uh, every day or two, the whole way up to Maine to sort of just recap it, and I'll just blend it all into one, but. Right now, I've got thunderstorms everywhere, Um, so this is night two, and I am just getting into the Gulf Stream, Uh, so my speed has gone from a good like six to seven knots, running with the southwesterly, to now seeing the nine and ten knots, Uh, but I'm reaching right outside of some pretty massive thunderstorms. Uh, booming thunder all day, and then now it's just a big lightning show. But uh was able to actually video some of it, which was kind of cool. Hoping, hoping that will actually turn out and, and look sort of decent. But I don't know. It's something with the Gulf Stream. Last year when I did this trip, perfect. Southerly breeze, not a cloud in the sky for days. It was great. We're doing like 200, 210 miles per day. Um, but in the past, my experience with the Gulf Stream is typically this thunderstorms and they kind of pop up everywhere. It's almost like being in the doldrums in a way, but they're all, they're all moving off to the East. Thankfully, um, there are a few others that are back on the other side of me, but I don't know. So far I've gotten pretty lucky. Uh, I haven't really felt any rain or 
really bad effects from the wind. But right now, in the last five minutes, pretty much since I started this, the wind has picked up more into the 25 range. But I've got reef main and just a staysail up. I haven't had to even use a jib yet. That's how much wind we've had, which is great. Uh, so it's pretty easy. Sparrows. I like to not throw sparrow into the deep end right right out of the gate you know she's been resting at the dock for six months and i would i would not want to get out of bed and have to go run a marathon so that's how i treat the boat nice and easy and although right now i feel like i might have a little too much sail up we're on day two so day two it's uh it's time to time to throw it down a bit but we are moving i mean right now oh yeah 9.6 9.2 and that's all gulf stream current that's not that's not uh mighty sparrow just flying through the water although we we definitely in these sort of conditions we've got six foot swell we're able to surf that so you know i'm sure the max speed is getting up into the 12 knot range uh, on some of the surfs and she does I don't know how, but this boat just, it will just jog down those waves. But, uh, yeah, other than that, uh, funny, this is one of the first, like, short trips that I feel like I have the boat really prepped on lockdown as far as there's just no, like, random things that are loose and making noise. I actually went the night before I left and put some tie-down sort of strap hooks up in the forepeak where normally I'm like piling and cramming stuff in using fenders and sail bags, anything to sort of pile and make things immobile. But then eventually, you know, I go from healing one direction to the other and then everything falls and I have to deal with it again. And I, I've done that for years, just pure laziness and just me being a moron but uh yeah i go up there now everything is locked into place it's lashed and i don't know it just it feels really good then i've got (laughs) my single super old school never been worn outside of a joke uh life jacket (laughs) which is one of those like it's the the type you put on a little kid, one of those orange sort of square looking ones. Uh it's got a little whistle on it, but so that's up there sitting there by itself. <laughs> I don't know, I always think it's funny cuz they, you know, solo sailor, we don't we don't really have a use for those things, but uh got to have them. Other than that, um I'd say the only drawback right now that I'm having, which is not much cuz this so far has been a pleasure cruise. Um, with the waves and stuff being sort of up and me pretty much almost like broad reaching running motion of the boat, I, I, I've got all this fresh food that I can't wait to cook. I want to make some cauliflower pizzas. Um, I want to do bacon, hash brown, big fry up. I haven't been able to touch any of that. I've literally had canned ravioli, um, some turkey wraps. Tonight I had noodles. I mean, just anything that's super easy because the, I mean, we're, we're getting slopped around like crazy out here. And, um, that is just a little bit annoying because I really don't want any of that fresh vegetables to go to waste, but, um, who knows, who knows, but I will, but I will say that my addition of one of those carbonators for water what a great idea. Thank you, Amy, back there at Ladies Island. You definitely gave me the idea on that one, and can't thank you enough. Normally, you know, cocktail hour for me consists of some t- sort of liquor that's mixed with water and ice, and that's it. And you know what? For scotch and a few other things, that's not so bad. But for a real cocktail... You want to have club soda, and rather than buy a case of that, which uh, I just don't have the room for that sort of stuff, uh, this little machine, and now I can just carbonate the water, and even if I just want to do 
a little bit of a carbonated water with a slice of lemon. Boom, done. And it tastes great. So I am absolutely loving that. And I don't know. Other than that, I have 72 beers on board, which is not what I intended. Uh, I bought a 24-pack so that I could have the odd beer here and there. And then a buddy of mine, Scott, came over, and he brought with him a 24-pack beer. And then another buddy, Aaron, came over uh, right before I left and had another case of beer. <laughs> but I am using those as my my cool sink. So they're my, the entire bottom of my refrigerator is filled with beers that were already cold in the first place. And then I did finally, I guess I wasn't 100% lazy this time, but I did my old routine, which I used to do in the Caribbean, which is take two gallon jugs of water and freeze them. So for a couple of days, left them in the freezer at the uh, marina. So they're just cubes. We're on day two, and these things are still pretty much solid. There's like a little quarter inch of water around them. Um, but they are helping to mitigate the power usage uh, of the fridge because I have some ham and bacon and things like that that need to stay frozen. So I have to keep the power up. Luckily, it's been super sunny each day. Because if I can get away with not having to run the engine pretty much the whole time, unless I need to move, I will do that. So so that's sort of the update. Other than that, just been feeling good, uh, enjoying it. Got pretty sunburnt the first day on that intercoastal. I'd say that's probably the thing that... Uh, it just I don't want to say it irritates me, but I, I dislike about that stuff is that you need visibility, you need to be able to see exactly what you're doing. So it's kind of hard the way I have Sparrow set up, you know, to to be in the shade and be able to do that. So I just sort of put sunscreen on every 15 minutes <laughs> for six hours, but still got pretty cooked. Uh, but now out here, Bimini's up, all that sort of stuff, which is nice. And yeah just rocket shipping um the forecast doesn't look great for the next day or so with a little bit of a northerly coming down but that may have changed i don't know um i gotta see if i can download the weather tomorrow uh for any updates i got a buddy back at ladies island richard who's uh sent me a couple of updates which is pretty cool but um yeah, other than that, just peeling away on this chart. And if if uh, if the long-term forecast holds true, it's going to be a southerly ride pretty much the whole way up there. And uh, I am totally looking forward to that. But other than that, I can't, I can't really think of anything else. Um, if I'm going to do one of these every couple of days or every day, um, I'm going to keep them at about 15 minutes. So this is night two uh, aboard Mighty Sparrow. Got lightning and thunderstorms all around me, but somehow I am uh, so far in the clear. <laughs> but I think I got to go up and put the second reef in the main because it is howling. All right. See you tomorrow. All right. Welcome to day three. We are bouncing around out here about 50 miles due east of Cape Hatteras, a.k.a. Graveyard of the Ocean, a.k.a. a place that can turn into a nightmare in seconds. <laughs> uh, and we are headed almost due north. We've had a bit of a wind shift, so we're looking at uh, winds are going to be coming out of the east and then clocking around to the north and then clocking all the way around to uh oh no start in the west they're clocking around to the west then they're going to go north then they're going to go east and then eventually back around to south so the whole system ought to take about three days or so to complete its rotation um so i'll try and take advantage as best i can right now i'm headed due north and just bouncing i mean this so we had oh geez <laughs> so this morning just at first light 
one of the big thunderstorms caught up with us and uh, basically threw down the hammer a little bit. And within an hour or so, down to just a second reef in the main, and it's really starting to pump, and we're just surfing waves. Um, you know, maybe blowing in the high 20s or or a little more, and then a big line squall is coming up. <laughs> and luckily, I sort of checked and just gave it an extra couple of seconds, and then I thought, okay, well, I might as well. So I put in the third reef, which with this boat, third reef is good to you know up to about 50 knots or so you can still just careen downwind and sparrow's in control she's not overpowered and she's moving well and (laughs) so boom that when that hit holy smokes the the wind definitely peaked out in that 50 knot range and then it sort of settled into about a mid 40s but Hi, it's just crazy. You forget just what it feels like to have 45 knots of sustained wind, you know, blowing spray all over the place. The whole surface of the the sea is completely rippled and getting streaks in it. You know, luckily it is only about an hour or two that it lasted, so the seas didn't build up huge, but they're big enough that now we're just sort of bouncing around and there's some old residual north like ground swell that's coming down as well but uh so we're oh getting getting all bobbed around but it is one of those things where i always count myself lucky after any any little blow or big blow any of that sort of stuff if the wind is still enough for you to sail then you're very lucky because i've had plenty of times where this would happen oh (laughs) and and uh, then there'd be no wind at all. And in those situations, you know, you leave your mainsail up, you can do some pretty big damage to the track. So I end up taking the mainsail down and just getting so mad. <laughs> Stewing down below. Uh, but uh, amidst the whole thing, you know, after I I forget just how wonderful Sparrow deals with sort of heavy winds and heavy seas i mean it really is a thing to behold it's it's kind of like you ever had that where you sort of give somebody you don't really like a, a job to do and you think oh yeah so this will be miserable and then you see the guy later on like whistling while he does it talking about how great it was and, uh, and you're just like oh well i think that's how the ocean that's how Sparrow treats the ocean sometimes, you know. You, you get all of a sudden this big wind and the seas are breaking. And Sparrow's just galloping along, surfing here, bouncing there, rolling here. Not a care in the world. And eventually I relax because, you know me, I'm a worrier. I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, should I get the storm jib? Should I need to be ready? You know, I like maybe not worrier, but a planner. I like to have a plan so that if, if all of a sudden things escalated, and it really got windy, take the main down, set the storm sail, that sort of thing. Um, and that is sort of my, that's my my game plan typically as the wind speed increases up to force 9, 10, 11 is basically third reef in the main, then take that down, put up the storm jib, sheeted hard in the center and so you're essentially bare poles and then after that you are bare poles after that you're just sort of (laughs) holding on for dear life but uh oh man it's raining hold on and we're back yeah it started raining so i just had to close the old hatch don't mind me if i ah crack into an ice cold bl figure i've earned it i've been up since about 3 30 this morning and even though it's only 11 o'clock been through a lot today already ah <sighs> my first my first uh real tough squall <laughs> in a long time since i would say since uh the fall and summer last last year when i was stuck in the atlantic doing my do my big loop of shame <laughs> mm. oh that's good Yep, so Sparrow's doing great. 
Mongo is doing really, really well. I was pretty worried because some some captain on some transient boat uh, trying to pull out of his slip slammed into my boat and basically struck Mongo and did some damage, but not enough that it was, you know, find the guy and track him down sort of thing. You know, it, it's kind of interesting, though. If you hit somebody's boat, typically you you want to kind of reach out to them. If not to say you'll cover any damages, just to say, you, you know, you're sorry about that. <laughs> uh, regardless, uh, I was worried about, you know, how it would go because it, it it didn't it didn't damage it as far as breaking anything more than the the rudder blade that I can get fixed but you never know the mechanism the servo gear system uh, it basically somehow was able to release itself and I put it all back together and I mean hey proof's in the pudding. Mongo steered us all through that that last little squall and doing great and uh, so yeah that alleviates some fears which is always nice. Mm. Ah, but yeah, I mean we were we were doing so well during it. Finally, I you know it, after an hour or so, it's still blowing really hard, and uh, but boy, I was hungry and I don't know. Just uh, the thought of oatmeal with raisins didn't quite cut it. And now that I've been out for a couple of days, I'm so used to the rolling motion that uh, I figured a little little bacon uh, had some, or not bacon, but turkey, egg, and cheese burrito. Delicious. Self-scrambled eggs because we're rolling around so much, but... Yeah, I don't know. Other than that, it's it's just off and on rain, and yeah, I'm not excited about the next couple of days, but I'm going to try and work it. The wind's supposed to die off a bit, and then once it swings around to the south, then it's going to be just building, building, building to probably like 30 knots or so for a few days. So this may be a pretty quick trip, you know, outside of the this little northerly coming in. I don't know. Pretty excited about it. It's been it's been a wonderful time being out at sea again and also just moving so fast right now. What are we what are we doing here? Oh gosh. Oh oop oh, oh there we go. Yeah we're we're going in between about six and nine knots. <laughs> just hopping these little waves but I think it's mostly the edge of the Gulf Stream. Once I get fully in that sucker, it's going to be awesome. Probably add another four knots. There was a little bit of time I was in it um, earlier this morning before the squall, and we were doing, yeah, we were, we were holding steady nine and a half knots, which is great because the boat's only doing six maybe when she's running in a good breeze. And so, yeah, you're, you're adding on quite a bit. But other than that, haven't cracked into any books yet. Kind of waiting until my mind is more at ease with everything. Because I, I still, I always, I always sort of overthink every noise, every creak, every groan. Keep checking over stuff to make sure nothing's coming loose. Because when a boat sits for six months, it's always a good thing to break it back in slowly. And, uh... So I'm always sort of paying attention. But other than that, I don't know. Kind of hoping the seas calm down enough for me to make pizza tonight. That would be awesome. Got to do that from scratch because that cauliflower is starting to get a tinge brown. But my two big ice ice uh, containers are still icy, <laughs> which is awesome. And other than that, no leaks to speak of. Everything's holding its own. And it's it's still nice and warm. Although I got a uh, text from one of my buddies up in Maine. He said it was 49 degrees this morning. The thought of 49 degrees is chilling to me right now. I mean, I'm I'm a little chilly. And 
it's just dropped down below, I think, 80 degrees. <laughs> uh, being down south, man, my, my blood thins out to that that hot, hot weather. I do, I do love it. But, yeah, okay, so I guess that's my update uh, for today. Maybe I'll do another one. I'm just going to do these whenever I... Uh, Whenever I feel like. So hopefully it'll create and capture what it's like to be aboard Sparrow. On, oh. <laughs> and if you're wondering why I'm... Oh, and, oh, and, uh, that's just when Sparrow rolls over about 20 degrees and the force of gravity hits me uh, pretty hard. <laughs> but yeah, we're making our way in this chart. I cannot wait to see what our daily run uh, our 24-hour run was, I'm guessing it's going to be pretty massive. I think the first day was about 145. I have a feeling we're going to be above 180 for this last 24 hours, and then it's going to take a big dip, but we'll get back into those big numbers. Any Anything above 120 for this boat is awesome. It means you are moving and you're moving well. But when you can add that current, it's absolutely exceptional. All right, that's it for Sparrow off of Cape Hatteras, day number three of the voyage from Buford, South Carolina, up to Rockland, Maine. All right. Okay, quick check. Do I have everything I need to make this a special moment for our my listeners? Cocktail, check. Sunset going on out there. Yeah, pretty much over. Uh, you can definitely, or I would think you'd be able to hear the creaking and groaning and sometimes the slatting of my mainsail. Uh, you guessed it. We are almost totally becalmed. Not 100%, but it's kind of one of those situations out here. Light winds, then variable winds, so they're up and down. But uh, we were sailing pretty pretty well there. And then now it's after... I don't know, it's always this funny thing, right around sunset. It seems like just before sunset it'll boost up. Sun will set, and then we'll probably get a little boost, and then it'll totally die. Last night, ended up uh, taking sails down and just drifting, but nice part was we were still in the middle of the Gulf Stream, so we were still doing almost four knots. <laughs> no sails, bear pulls, baby. Woo! But yeah, so I guess to get official, uh, I believe this is the end of day four out here on the ocean we are if i check my chart we're about as far offshore as we will be so i guess in a lot of ways we are deep ocean we're uh, let's see 120 doing my little finger dance 120 240, or about 250 miles from any point of land. That includes Bermuda. I'd say we're almost halfway between Boston and Bermuda right now. Feels pretty good, <sighs> not going to lie. Wish we had some more wind, but... Right now, at least the, the sails are up and they're not just continuously slatting. If they start <laughs> continuously slatting, then I will take them down. Luckily, the sea state is pretty small, so if I take them down, I'm still going to roll, but not super violently. So, <clears throat> we'll just sort of see where we're, we're going to go. I mean, if I have to take a pause, I will. No big deal. But I do hope that everyone can appreciate uh, I went what, I, what I've what i gone through just, just to be able to do this, this podcast. Because the other ones, you know, when I'm on the boat, the easiest thing to do is just hold the microphone in your hand. That, so that means, you know, if we're rocking and rolling, only got one hand to hold on to things, a.k.a. cocktail, stuff like that. And so <clears throat> it's not quite as convenient. So, But to be able to put this, this crazy little, you know, robotic arm-looking stand-up, I <laughs> had to take apart some of the uh, 
fresh varnish work that I did. It was only three screws, really, so not a huge deal. But I'm just, you know, relaying the information here. It's pretty crazy. Ugh. I was listening to a lot of, of Bill Burr, his podcast that he does. Guy is so, so funny. He could literally just do an entire special about uh, where, where people just email him and he just reads these emails. I mean, he just... <laughs> I I, I got to give it to the guy because you could tell that he's actually trying to. He's trying. He he's got some concern for these strangers who write into him, so he doesn't just tear them apart. But boy, you mess up a little grammar, you ask a dumb question, and he will he'll let you have it. But in the end, he's always answering stuff. But boy, he's funny. Oh my gosh, I listen to a lot of podcasts out here. It's pretty good. It's um, not all the time. Because I do like to sometimes just sort of be completely immersed in what's going on around me. I must have spent hours just watching the, the ocean today. Kind of wondering, you know, like, you, you go through and you're, you're looking around, but you're not really looking for anything. You're just looking at everything. And the reason you're looking around is because the view is 360 degrees. And, you know, if something does come into view, had a few ships uh, pass by today, so that was kind of cool. Nothing close, though. But we did have this Japanese car ship, and holy smokes, those things are so ugly. This one was white, or maybe it was gray, I don't know. But it was, I mean, it just it looks like a block that somebody just sort of shaved and rounded the front off. Just a little bit, but I mean, anytime I see those car carriers, I think back to Star Wars of those those roving recycling things uh, where they got the drones, R two or the androids or what? Jeez, I don't even know what R two D two and C three P O droids, right? Drones? Oh my gosh, brain not working. I haven't. Uh, I I don't know. Maybe I I slept a lot today. Who knows? Anyway, but uh, so that's my Star Wars rant. Right now on the menu for the Sundowner Cocktail Hour is pretty simple. Uh, it's a vodka soda with a entire wedge of lemon. That's pretty good. I've got ice. It's pretty sophisticated. I think I was talking about before that I, I purchased one of those carbonators. And I don't know. It is nice. Uh, just to be able to carbonate the crap out of some waters is pretty cool. Because I don't want to have to buy a case of, of those things. Boy, I, I just... The amount of stuff. Consumables. When I'm trying to get ready for a trip and stuff like that, and granted, you know, I know I'm going to be out here for two weeks, got to prepare for, I don't know, three weeks or whatever, but boy, just the amount of packaging that I open and then discard, oh, there's got to just, there's got to be a better way. It's got to be a better way. Anyway, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm already going just wormholing <laughs> down on these things. Oh, come on, wind. Just give us a little, a little oomph. I don't want to have to go up there and take the sails down. Uh, that's my plight. That's my plight right now. That's the cross that I am bearing, is that I have sails up that I don't want to take down because I want to keep moving. Even if your sails are slatting, you still they generate a little forward motion. But it's the fact that the wind is just up and down. All right, I see the American flag starting to flutter. <laughs> and wha-bam! It's not violent sledding. If it was violent sledding, I'd have to pause here and uh, get up top. But uh, I guess maybe I should set the scene a little bit. So sun went down. Sky's still, you know, it's blue, but it's darkening. There's patchy clouds. There's some high-level clouds. Right now, I'm in kind of the middle 
of a very weak high pressure system that's come off the coast the eastern seaboard and cruised out from the Chesapeake out here it's encompassing pretty much the area between Nova Scotia Bermuda and the east coast I'm right smack dab in the middle of it so completely become seas my position is still pretty much in the Gulf Stream, if not right on the northern edge of where it does its jog and turn to the east. So almost due, due south of the Great South Channel, I believe it's called, in between George's Bank and Cape Cod. Again, 250 miles offshore. And boy, it does feel good. I, I got I to gotta say, the first couple of days where you're sort of cruising the coast... You know, in the past, before I danced with the devil of the Gulf Stream, I used to head out from places like Charleston or whatever, and I would go straight across the stream, get a couple hundred miles offshore, then turn north. But in my old age, some might say wisdom, some might say ignorance or complacency, but or just, just flat-out laziness because I... I don't know. It's so interesting. You know, I love being out at sea. And yet when I plan these passages, plan these passages, I'm trying to do the most efficient. I I guess that just goes with sailing. But, you know, point A to point B, you're going to try and do the most efficient route. But you're not in a hurry and you actually want to take some time. And a perfect example of that, though, today. So looking at the weather forecast and everything, it's not great. Winds are keep keep veering around and when i say veering veering means the the winds are are turning in a clockwise fashion as far as the direction they're coming from so if if the wind was coming from the north going to the south which we call a northerly wind if it's veering it's going in a clockwise direction so it's coming from the north then it's coming from the northeast then it's coming from the east and so on and so forth if a wind is backing, it's going counterclockwise. So if it started in the north, it would go to northwest, then west, and on and on. Just a little clarification. I don't know, you know, sometimes sometimes you listen to some of the sailing podcasts, which I sort of dropped off. I really do enjoy Matt Rutherford's podcast because he, he's not just talking about sailing. He I don't know, he's kind of funny. How he feels all the time. I mean, he's got a knowledge. He's got... S- just an insane knowledge of so many different boats because he's a boat broker um man it's it's uh, i i like listening to his 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 is really good um mm. boy i'm gonna need a refill here in a second <clears throat> but yeah uh so that's where i am that's a, this this podcast may end up actually being like the middle trip and i may do its own depending on how, how long i can ramble on here but I'm going to just be probably diverging into different topics. There's going to be no rhyme or reason. I tried to <laughs> I tried to actually do a podcast um, with a friend of mine who's sort of, uh, I don't want to call her a health nut because she's, she's definitely not, but she's, she's healthy. She likes to take care of herself. She likes to eat well. And um, we did a podcast together just talking because I, you know, I was sort of experimenting with eating better and not so much eating better because I've always done like salads and try, I don't eat like junk food or sugar and stuff, but, um, wanted to do just a podcast sort of sharing information. And it just, when I listened to it, it was, it was cool, but there was just no, I, there was no structure to it at all. And sort of, I don't, I, I tried to listen to it as if I was just listening to my podcast, looking for, Oh, jeez. Doors are opening now. See, this is, this is my plight. It's my cross to bear. I'll be back. Ah! Old Georgie. So I got this door. Ah! There we go. Lock it up. Lock it up. Cripes. Ugh! Slide back into the nav station. Yeah, I got this door. And it's the door for the head. And it is kind of creepy because I don't know what kind of wood it's made out of, but it's varnished wood. And on the backside, the inside of the door, 
It resembles two eyes and a nose in a very sinister sort of pose. Oh, jeez. I think these sails are going to have to come down. We might have to pause this. I think we're going to have to pause this and come back. Well, let me tell at least the story about the door. Sales will be fine. So the door, yeah, I mean, and the kind of the odd thing is you, you just be sailing. I, I'm just sitting in here cooking all day. Nothing's changing, blah, blah, blah. It's all good. And then all of a sudden, wham, and you hear it. And then wham, and it slams. And the little latches just come undone. But every time it opens, it shows those eyes, and they're staring right at you. It's kind of those eyes, you ever see those on a billboard where you walk past it and the eyes keep sort of following you because the person has looked like directly perfectly into the camera at least i assume that's why it is but in any event yeah when it opens up that's the first thing you see so i i call that george uh sort of the ghost of uh one of my buddies good old scotty oh i haven't heard from him in a long time our communication was always facebook but that sort of uh ended Old old Facebook had to shut that one down. Just too toxic that place. Yikes! It's like uh, it's like being in a mosh pit <laughs> a concert. Just don't go there unless you want to butt heads with people. Yeah, who knows? Ooh, we got a little breeze. We got a little breeze. Ah, uh, yeah, but. Great night last night. Take the sails down, drift along, slept for, I don't know, three, four hours. Woke up, saw that not much had changed, went right back to bed. And, I mean, last night last night was like a party on this boat. And I know it's a party one, depressing, whatever. Maybe to you, but not to me. Because out here, I don't know, I never, I never feel alone. I've got Mongo back there doing his thing. Sparrow... I'm I'm literally inside of Sparrow. <laughs> oh, that's kind of dirty. But no, it just I don't know. I I it was great and I rolled out the old the old sc- big screen down below, put up the tiny projector right to the little ceiling mount that I made. First I watched Cat Ron while I made a giant cauliflower pizza. And which that that movie just I don't know. It, I watch that, and all I want to do is go back to the Caribbean. It just kept around as my hero, Ron Rico. Hey there, boss. Call me Captain Ron. Everybody does. Give me another brewski there, Swap. Love it. If you haven't seen it, Kurt Russell, Marty Short. <laughs> oh, it's so good. But yeah, I watched that and was just, you know, having such a good time and ended up... Uh, Wanting to delve down the old inspirational movie that I love. Probably one of, at least one of my top three movies of all time. Which, you'll probably be like, what, when you hear it. But Joe versus the Volcano. Yes. That old Spielberg classic. Cult classic, maybe. You just don't hear much about it, even though it's got Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan. It's, I don't know, that movie is absolutely... I, I would say more than any anything I've ever seen on a screen, that has influenced my life more than any other thing I've ever seen. Yeah, think about that. Think about that. And you, you may ask why. Oh. Oh, you want to know why? Well, let me let me fix up another uh uh little cocktail here. I need a little top up. And then we're going to get into Joe versus the Volcano and why it is such a great movie. All right. And we're back. Almost. Just going to sit in my handy dandy seat here. Oh, there we go. Mm. Wind's come around. I think I might have to uh, tack. Tack around. It's kind of weird in these systems. Uh, how... When you're in the center, the wind really does shift. I mean, if you go from the south side of it to the north side of it, the winds go in the opposite direction. Funny. Anyway, okay, so Joe V. the Volcano. 
I freaking love, love that movie. Probably seen it, no joke, 300 times. Um, I remember seeing it when it first came out when I was a kid because it was Tom Hanks. And it's sort of this story, like fairy tale almost. But in reality, I believe that there, there's huge amounts. So just real quick, what I like about this. And spoiler alert <laughs> for anybody who hasn't seen the movie from the early 80s, I think, I believe. Um, so if if uh, you get upset about that, I, I don't know what to tell you. You probably should have seen it in the last 40 years. But some of the things I like, one is it just has huge amounts of symbolism in it, which you wouldn't notice if you don't actually sort of watch it a couple times. Two, it's just a great uh, adventure story. And three, the whole underlying essence of this movie is just so inspirational. It's so spot on for anybody who just is like stuck in a rut and wants to get out and wants to live, live a real life. That's, I think... That's the biggest underlying thing that, that really hit me was just you got to go out and live your life. You got to go follow your dreams. Do do whatever you really want to do. There's no reason not to. So wrap that up with the old TH and a little MG or no, MR, Meg Ryan, back in the 80s. Huh. Oh, it's classic. It's just It's just so good. But, I mean, just to set up. If you haven't seen it, or if you have seen it but you're trying to remember what uh, the whole point of that thing was, boy, I think I am going to have to take these sales down. Ah, this cross is getting pretty heavy. <laughs> mm. Ah. So anyway, Joe. Joe is basically working in a horrible job. He used to be a firefighter, but the stress got to him after some heroic stuff. You don't really learn about that until later in the movie, but he's working at this totally depressing factory that produces petroleum products like fake arms, prosthetics, things like that. Uh, But it's just a nightmare old school factory Probably the equivalent today would be working in in some sort of Amazon fulfilling warehouse or something like that, where you're basically just treated as a cog in the machine and nothing else. But uh, so he goes in and he's got a doctor's appointment and he goes to this doctor and basically they tell him that he's got a brain cloud. And the first I don't know, some of the first like big symbolism really that comes in is this doctor's office is just it's just bleak he's in this waiting room the walls are made of this old school design that that looks like braille and i would be very interested to find out if there's actually like writing on the wall um in there like sneaky sneaky i don't know i if i could have a sit down with steven spielberg and be like hey come on what's up Showing all these crazy things, I would love to. It'd be it'd be the one if if everybody's granted that as a wish. Like, yeah, you can sit down with whoever directed whatever movie. You can do it just once, though. Mine would be this one. So anyway, he goes in and he goes from the stark waiting room. This crazy nurse that looks like the nurse from uh, One Flew Over or no, not one. Yeah, One Flew Over the Cookie's Nest. And he goes into this just mahogany, smoky beautiful doctor's office fireplace burning you know in the corner um leather bound books everywhere old school dictionary open on a pedestal you know at a moment's notice i don't know what that word is i must look it up i do miss that we never had that at our house obviously but we did have an old oxford english dictionary with (laughs) it had paper it was so thin. I mean, thin, like 
unbelievably thin because the thing was like 4,000 pages long or something. It was a giant book, biggest book we had, obviously. Um, but supposedly like every single word in the English language was in it. There was a movie about creating that that was just amazing. Oh, my gosh. Anyway, so goes into the doctor's office. Doctor tells him that he's got a brain cloud, um, terminal illness. He's going to die. He's got six months to live. And Joe's just, like, freaking out. He knew it, though, because he, he's a hypochondriac because he just hasn't been feeling good. He just doesn't feel good. Everything, you know, you know those times where you're just – you're sort of in a rut. Things aren't great. You're not exercising. You're not eating right, all this stuff. You start to not feel good. Well, that's how he was feeling. So he goes in, gets this terrible diagnosis, and then boom. He goes, next scene, back in at work and under these fluorescent lights in this dismal office, listening to Meg Ryan's character number one, typing away at the typewriter. And he just blows in there like a new fresh breeze. And his boss is there, and and there's a big confrontation. But that's where one of the lines, and I'm hoping I'll get it correct, but basically he quits his job. And there's a reference to the Odyssey in in this and Romeo and Juliet, which is why I think think in a lot of ways – like I said, I mean, this is this is sort of a modern day remake of, you know, the great adventure story, the great love story, all that sort of stuff, all wrapped into one. I don't know. I think Spielberg had some some really underlying things, some sneaky stuff in this. So he goes out and he pulls out these books out of his desk and then he quits. But when he quits, he he has a confrontation because his boss basically says, you'll be easy to replace. And he's about to walk out, but then he thinks, I should say something. And he turns back around, and, and the consensus of his little tirade really is just, he says, you know, why? He's like, I sold my life to you for $300 a week, and I ask myself why. He says, well, actually, he knows why. Because he was too chicken shit afraid to live his own life, so he sold it. For $300 a week. And that's the realization. That's the thing that I played over and over in my head so many times. You have, we all have, this one little chunk of time that we're here. And what we do with that, or more importantly, what we exchange that for is absolutely huge and but most most of the time we don't think about that we don't we don't think that okay we have this valuable the most precious asset we own is our time and we just are so quick to oh i will trade you 40 hours per week and in reality 40 hours per week You've still have you have to figure in the opportunity cost of those forty hours. You can't exactly go out and howl at the moon every single night. You have to spend time to get ready for work. All stuff forty hours. It's more like probably like fifty or sixty. So sixty hours a week, and that all that time is dedicated and traded for a certain paycheck, so that then you can you know, purchase certain things or have certain conveniences in life. And that's the thing is what are you willing to trade it for? If you look at it that way, you could actually sit down with a notepad and start dissecting and being like, wow, because the actual reality of it, the scary part of that is you are trading your life. That's your time. Your life is your time. Life is time. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm just thinking about all this, too, right now. As I have a million times, because I've watched this movie a million times, and I think about the same thing every single time. But it just uh, it resonates with me so much. That, that thinking of, like, wait a minute, what am I doing? 
Like I, if I don't in thoroughly enjoy the job that I'm doing and then, it, you know, it, it's almost as if, as if, you know, they, they always have that old saying of like, well, you know, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And I think that's really, really true because if you can figure out a way like, oh yeah, I really like to, I really like to paint and you start painting and you're able to figure out a way to sell your paintings and the actual painting becomes your full-time job. Perfect. There you go. You get to do exactly what you would be doing even if you weren't being paid for it. And I, I suppose that's that's sort of the that's the the key in a lot of ways, but I don't know. I, I don't want to get too deep into it because I think a lot of people realize this. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there people just don't think about it as much. It's kind of crazy, you know, when I was younger used to talk about a lot of that stuff. You'd have those deep, long conversations, you know, around campfires, smoking a lot of weed or whatever. I don't know. And those those conversations slowly sort of fade out as you get older and older, it seems. But then every once in a while, you'll have another one. And I don't know. They are pretty good. But I do. I, I think when I'm out at sea or just, just on, on Sparrow, I, I definitely think about stuff a lot more. Then if I'm just going through sort of the daily grind and there, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to bad mouth, you know, working, having a good job that pays and you get to work with a good team of people. I mean, I'm headed up to Maine to go do two months of work uh, in the boatyard, basically lifting and hauling boats and putting them in the water. I mean, we're, we're basically talking about trading trading my time but uh, <laughs> it may sound like not the greatest job you know hauling around bricks of wood and boat stands and then walking really slowly and making sure we don't hit anything and then launching a boat and doing it you know six seven times a day but in all actuality i really enjoy it i wouldn't want to do it year round or anything like that i'm sure it would get pretty old but for a couple of months to help out the boat yard and work with this great team of people that are just a cast of characters all on their own. That's great. I love it. And I wouldn't, even if I wasn't being paid, like say, let, let's say money wasn't an, uh, an issue at all. Like I didn't need to eat or whatever. <laughs> and I didn't need money. Oh my gosh. I would still do it. I would still do it without getting paid. It's just that much fun. Um, but again, it's, it's only for, a few weeks and maybe it's not all that fun when it's raining and it's cold and you're still out there and you're all muddy and everything. Cause boat air is a really dirty place still for whatever reason, my little crazy brain finds that hilarious. <laughs> Bring it on more misery. Yeah. Hey everybody. Thanks for listening. And if you enjoy the podcast and want to support it, just go to podbean.com and you can become a patron and keep the show on the air. Also, if you like the music at the beginning, the album is called Deep Teal and the artist is Adrian Edson. It's available on Amazon Music. And if you want the full story of the trip around the world, the book, the Kindle book, and the audio book can all be found on amazon.com, Sailing Into Oblivion, the solo nonstop voyage of the mighty sparrow. Fair winds and following seas.